Howdy, everyone. Um, so Dr. Hakim seems to be running a little late, so I will just give the preamble before he, uh, before he gets here. My name is Dr. Rob Parks. I am the Deputy Director of the Observatory here at George Mason Observatory. And um, tonight is one of our Evening Under the Stars events. This is an event that we have, or event series that we host uh, every fall and spring semester, and we try to do it every other Tuesday evening, although scheduling conflicts do uh, occur. And the idea is to uh, open our observatory to the public, first to have them experience a talk given by an astronomer or someone in the astronomy community, and then we uh, take you over to our observatory and allow you to look through our 32-inch telescope and smaller telescopes, depending on if we can get them set up. Uh, so that's basically what we're here to do, uh, here tonight to do. And this is not working. So one of the silver linings of the pandemic is that it accelerated something that we wanted to do anyway. Prior to, uh, prior to the whole pandemic thing, uh, we would control the telescope, which is located on uh, the silver tower attached to Reacher, uh, Research Hall. So it is in that dome that you see there. I've heard this uh, tower described as many things um, from a the one that really sticks in my mind is a silo. Uh, some people think that apparently that's a grain silo, which tells me they've never been on a farm before. But if you were wondering what that was, that is in fact our observatory uh, and it is, was before controlled solely from the control room, which you will all uh, be given a tour of. But one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to uh, allow for observations of with the telescope to be done anywhere with anyone who has internet access. And so because of uh, lockdown, we really had to get onto that. So that's essentially what we have done now. So if you have the appropriate uh, credentials and you can log into our system, you can control our 32 inch telescope from anywhere in the world um, and you can take data with it. And so a lot of our students uh, uh, utilize, this, uh, utilize this, this feature to uh, basically Sit in, a, sit in their uh, room, uh, sit in their be bedroom and with their pajamas and take data. Uh, the images that we see uh, that you see around are images that have been taken of, uh, are images of celestial objects, galaxies, nebulae, et cetera, uh, that have been taken by, uh, by our students using the 32 inch telescope. And so this has been, this astrophotography has been a rather evolved process. And now the students have gotten to the point where they feel adept enough for the challenge of creating a, a deep sky image. So this is after the, uh, the tradition of Hubble, where one of, the more, one of the first and most famous images that Hubble took was a Hubble deep sky image. And that was when the director of Hubble said, I want to take over this telescope and I want to point it at a part of the sky that has nothing in it. And I want to look at it for days. And so he did. And he, uh, and he, just, uh, he created an image or an image was uh, found that profoundly changed our view of cosmology. That first Hubble deep field image was the one that really cemented the idea that the universe is filled with galaxies that there are trillions upon trillions of galaxies out there in the universe, all evenly distributed. And so going along that line, what the students have decided to do is basically look at, a, uh, look at an object. In this case, they are not looking at a part of the sky that's not, uh, that there isn't anything there. They know something is there, but they're gonna look at it for hours. So typically these, uh, these images, uh, those are taken probably all total, maybe an hour's worth of observations were put into creating those images. The one on the left of the cocoon, that is 18 hours worth of imaging that uh, the students did on subsequent nights. 
they learned how to stack those images together and combine them into a the three color image that you see there. This one, which looks much better on my monitor than it does here, is actually a spiral galaxy. You can kind of see some of it here uh, at the center. Uh, and that is an ongoing process. Right now, they're about halfway through. So the idea is they want to, um, we have students who rise to the challenge of using our telescope, not only just for science, but also for uh, astrophotography like this. I've already um, kind of described Evening Under the Stars. As I said, um, it is a two-part event where we have the speaker um, give a 30, 45 minute talk, followed by a brief Q&A. And then we will all move over to the, uh, the observatory over at Research Hall, where we open up the 32 inch for as long as you want to, to look at stuff. Uh, for those of you who are online currently, what we're going to do is as soon as we're done here, we're going to switch over and one of our uh, tour guides, very competent, very enthusiastic tour guide by the name of Ian. Is that, that sounds like Hakeem. That's definitely Hakeem. Um, uh, Ian will lead you on a virtual tour um, of the observatory. And yeah. There's the matter of the hour. This is not a one person operation. As I said, my name is Dr. Rob Parks. I am the deputy director of the observatory. Uh, Dr. Peter Plavchan is the director. Uh, we also have three graduate assistants who help us, uh, Kevin, M, and Patrick. And we have a slew of uh, tour guides. Nasir is uh, one of right here. You'll meet Ian, uh, like I said, a very lar uh, a large, enthusiastic fellow. Uh, Jonathan is also one of our tour guides, but he is also the president of the Friends of the Observatory Club. So if you are a George Mason student and are interested in astronomy and just want to uh, learn more about it, I highly recommend you join their club. That QR code from my understanding is still current and will get you to their Discord. Uh, those are the current officers uh, uh, they have. They have monthly meetings. Uh, they do a number of variety of different uh, while well, they have meetings, they also, but most importantly, or at least for me, if I were a student, uh, we allow them to use the telescope pretty much unsupervised for a few hours every other week. So if you really like to, uh, if you really want to get your hands on our 32 inch telescope and look at uh, deep sky objects, photo is the way to go. We also have a solar telescope that Jonathan frequently takes out uh, so that we can safely look at the sun. If you are interested in what we are doing here at the observatory in terms of our outreach, our research, uh, what our students are doing, I highly recommend you look, uh, you subscribe to our uh, newsletter, The Moon, the Mason Observatory Outreach Newsletter, which you can see there. Um, one of the things, when I got hired here, I've only been here for about two and a half years. Uh, one of the things that I really wanted to do was to improve or increase rather our outreach presence, uh, specifically towards communities that do not ordinarily have the resources to experience the night sky through telescopes or through planetariums. And so one of the things that is my uh, priority is to take our telescopes and our inflatable planetarium and take it out into the public and allow uh, students to have uh, that opportunity. Fortunately, that does take a little bit of money. So if you'd like to support us financially, please consider becoming one of our patrons. You can do so at various other levels. And so we have, and I know I'm going to butcher your last name again, uh, Dr. Hakeem Alusie. Alusie? Alusie. I knew I was going to get that wrong. Um, he is a, uh, he is Robinson professor uh, here at George Mason. We are very lucky to have him. Uh, he was part of the faculty at uh, Florida Institute of Technology. Uh, he has an author of a best-selling memoir, Quantum Life, My Unlikely Journey. The stories that he's told me from the book, definitely something to pick up. Um, definitely recommend that. Uh, and he's been on a number of uh, different uh, shows on Science Channel from How This uh, Universe Works, Space's Deepest Secrets, Strip the Cosmos, and you were also a food judge? Make it impossible on, on Netflix, on Netflix. So 
Uh, and he is going to be giving a talk today on the sun, if I'm not mistaken. Yes? Okay, all right. Well, um, please welcome Dr. Akeem Lucie. Dr. O. Dr. O. Dr. O. Dr. O. Dr. O. <laughs> all right. When well, your name is unpronounceable. Uh, that's going to be finicky. Is this a Mac? Yeah, I got a connector. It's not going to work. What? No, it's it not going to work. In the classrooms. I yeah. Every day. Yeah, not in this one. The the This room. Y'all follow me. We can give it a shot. We can give it a shot. <laughs> but, but we better. All right. Okay. Oh, man. How you got to pull that one on me? Uh, this, the, room is, this room is special. The old this room is special trick. Try that. Oh, oh all right. I don't know if that's going to work with our virtual audience. Oh, we have a virtual audience. We okay. do have a virtual audience. No, I'm really nervous. <laughs> like laptop? Still sharing with a laptop. Oh, is there another selector? Laptop versus PC? There we go. All right. It's just got a really it works for you. See? Yeah. See? Yeah. See? Yeah. All right. So, all right. The sound is selected. All right, so let me see if I can. Howdy, y'all. No, no. I'm from the country. I grew up eating squirrels and pops and everything. So if I, you know, if I happen to go back into my old days, don't panic. All right. I'll tell you a true story. So when I, I got to uh, graduate school in a fancy California uh, university, I expected it to be urban. But it wasn't right. It was it was uh, a lot of woods on campus, a lot of wild animals. So the first week of classes, so I'd lived in the country for the last decade, right, in Mississippi. So the first week of classes, I um, go up to this guy while before the professor comes in. You know, there's a murmur of voices, right? But you can hear I'm loud. So I turn to this dude and I'm like, "Hey, man, you saw these squirrels on campus?" And he goes, "Yeah." I say, "How come nobody eats them?" And like the room went silent. Everybody looks at me. <laughs> you understand, right? You grew up in the good old days when yeah. squirrels were a delicacy. All right. <laughs> but, I, you know, nowadays I figured they'll be full of toxins. So I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> All right. All right. So let's talk about the sun. But before we do, so you guys, you said I do some TV stuff. I like to like set the mood by showing some of my TV stuff. So let's hope the sound works. Do we have a, a volume control? Pump that sucker up. <laughs> it's like those old shoes. Here we go. All right. Here we go. Oh, the Reeboks. Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> the creativity of human beings never ceases to amaze me. We are aware that this is what people are doing for fun these days. That's dangerous. Read it out. I saw this guy. This clip is one that makes me say, Why? Why? way around to be really an engineering i want to see things explode i want to see them fall to pieces it should be big it should be crazy and it should make things happen that i've never seen before and he's just doing it for fun all right Alan. all right i'm gonna show you guys i'm actually an experimentalist and i get into the act people in the abeg industry um told that what we were trying to do was impossible and it will be seven years later. We asked a key to simulate a bug. Yes. All right, here we go. Oh.
uh oh man, it turned off my, I did it. Because the helmet wasn't actually supposed to explode. That was the whole thing to show that it only explodes if you actually fall. So uh, yeah, the other bit of background information is that it comes in different sizes, small, medium, and large. I was wearing a, me a small, my head's at least a medium. So, you know, it hurts. <laughs> All right, so let's start with the sun. The big nuclear bomb in the center of our solar system that we're orbiting. So, um, you know, when we at astronomers think of the sun, we don't think of it as a single thing. We really think of it as a thing with two main parts, all right? One part we call the core. So the core extends out to about 25% of the radius. And the other part, the rest of it, we call the envelope or envelope, depending upon where you grew up, right? Now, here's the thing. 50% of the sun's mass is in the core. The other 50% is in the envelope. And what happens with stars as they age, ah, oh, that's the slide I didn't add, is that they throw off their envelope and the core is left behind, right? And so if you look at the sun today or an average star, it's what we call a main sequence star. So what's happening is this thing is big and massive, right? A hundred times bigger than Earth. So gravity wants to just like crush it down in much the same way that the left side of your head is attracted gravitation to the right side of your head, but your head doesn't go Right? And the reason why is because there's some greater force pushing outward. So for a star, the greater force that holds up your head and the Earth is not sufficient, right? Because there's too much mass, too much gravity. So what really supports the sun from just collapsing in on itself is the radiation pressure of the light that's streaming out from the core. And what that means is, is that the core and the envelope are doing a dance. Right, where you know the core they they impact each other and they respond to each other. As an example, as the sun burns, not burns, but nuclear burning, what we call fusion, as it fuses protons to create helium, here's basically how they go. So you have two protons, all right. So think of these protons as being surrounded by an electric field, all right, that extends out in every direction. But imagine that they are a little sphere. They're not. But imagine that they are a little sphere. And that the surface of that sphere is covered with an incredibly sticky substance. All right? So it has a big field and a sticky surface. So if I have two protons and I start making them travel towards each other, they're going to feel each other's electric field. And because they have the same electric charge, they're going to repel each other. Just like you try to hold two poles of a magnet that match, they repel each other, right? But as the star is forming and is compressing, getting smaller and smaller because of gravity, if you take a gas and you compress it, that heats the gas. That's one reason why when you see a spacecraft coming in, re-entering Earth's atmosphere, one thing that heats it up is not just friction, but it's the fact that you're actually compressing the gas, right? So that heats it up. Um, and as the core gets hotter and hotter, as two protons are on a collision course and they veer off, but what is temperature? Temperature is a measure of how fast the particles are moving. So as it gets hotter, because it's getting more and more compressed, the protons are moving faster and faster, which means they get closer and closer before they veer off. And at the magic temperature of about 10 million degrees Kelvin, they get close enough where they touch each other's surface, and their glue stick. And instead of getting repelled away, they stick together. Now, in reality, that glue is another field that we call the strong force, and it's 137 times stronger than the electric force that wants to push them apart, right? So they end up sticking together. And that's one step in a process that ultimately results in a helium nucleus. So a helium nucleus, has twice the electric charge of protons. So what's the consequence of that? The consequence is, even though two individual protons can get close enough to fuse, because hot helium nuclei have twice the electric charge at the temperature of 10 million, they still can't get close enough. So all that helium that's created is dumped into the core, all right? But it's not burning. What holds up the outer layers? the light from the burning process. So because that helium 
is in there not burning, it's not putting out any light. And as a result, there is no pressure pushing out sufficient to hold it up, so the core shrinks. So what happens when the core shrinks? You shrink a gas, you compress it, it gets hotter, right? So because the core gets hotter, how does the envelope respond? You heat a gas, it expands. So the envelope expands. So the sun today, I think the number is about 70% brighter than when it formed because it's bigger, right? Every day, the sun is a bit brighter than it was the day before. So the sun is going to continue to expand and in about a billion years, it's going to be so big and putting out so much light that the oceans are going to boil away and life as we know it on Earth is no longer going to be possible. But that's a billion years from now. All right? Don't worry about it. Pay your insurance. You're good to go. Um, you just got to get planetary insurance. Sell that. Affleck. <laughs> Lehman Brothers. Uh, so... Ultimately, the sun is going to expand and become what we call a red giant. And then uh, eventually, when its core reaches 100 million degrees, the actual helium will begin to burn. And at that point, the sun is going to expand by another third, right? And what will happen then? That's like 4 billion, 5 billion years from now. The Earth will be inside of the sun. So get your tickets to Titan because, you know, this is not going to be a good place to live. Now, you see that we divide the envelope into these two regions, the radiated zone and convective zone. And what that has to do with is how the energy that created in the core is um, uh, propagated outward to the surface. So what you see here, this little squiggly line is an example of what we call the random walk problem. So imagine if I'm standing right here now. And imagine that every time I, I'm going to start walking, and every time I take a step, I take a step in any random direction. Can you calculate how long it would take me to get out the door? No. Yes, you can. <laughs> it is a well-known statistical problem called the random walk problem. So we see that the photons that are created in the core when a photon is created in the core from a fusion reaction, it ceases to exist really fast because it bumps into another proton, it gets absorbed, some of that energy gets sent out somewhere. So what this really represents is not the photon itself, but the energy of that photon. So on average, it takes anywhere from 10,000 to 100 and something, 70,000 years from the energy of a photon created in the core to get out of this, to leave from the surface of the sun, that energy. Right, a long time. Now, why the radiated zone? Why the convective zone? Well, it has to do with how the energy is uh, propagates. So, for example, are we all putting out energy right now? Yes. What kind? Yes. What's the what's that heat really? Infrared radiation, right? Yeah, the sun got radiation too, and some infrared. But we got infrared radiation. If, I, if it was completely dark in here. I put on night vision goggles, you'll see that everybody in here is a big infrared light bulb, right? So matter cools itself by emitting light. So that energy wants to transition out. So suppose I have a parcel of gas, a volume of gas. Once that volume of gas moves upward from the core toward the surface, the pressure drops. That makes the parcel of gas expand. When it does, an expanding gas gets cooler. When it cools, is it still hotter than the surrounding material? If it is, it will continue to, 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 to move upward and expand. But if it's not, it sinks back down. So in the radiative zone, that's the area where pockets of gas expanding and moving upwards is not sufficiently efficient in carrying the energy, so light carries the energy. Then you get to this region called the tachocline, and from here up, it is parcels of gas, so the outer third of the sun is basically boiling. So think of the sun as like a, having a planet-wide ocean of, of, of boiling plasma on its surface. So when we first started studying the sun, the first thing that jumps out to us is sunspots, all right? And so people came up with, uh, they came with the idea of, let me count the number of sunspots on the surface of the sun. And this is what they got. They saw the number of sunspots 
change and it went from a minimum to a maximum back to a minimum over the course of 11 years. All right. And then they also plotted where do the sunspots show up? And they noticed that when they show up at first, you get to this period where there's no sunspots. When they first start showing up again, they show up near the pole. And then progressively, they show up closer and closer and closer to the uh, step to the sun's equator, and then they just disappear. And what this has to do with is the sun's magnetic field. And sometimes the sunspots just stop showing up altogether, right? And it looks like we're going into a period now where the sun is becoming much more quiet than normal, uh, many fewer sunspots. Well, when that happened the last time, you guys heard of the Irish potato famine and the Little Ice Age? Yeah. Well, we don't. We can't say that the solar activity is a direct cause of the terrestrial weather events, but the fact that they correlate is interesting. Was anybody in here was around in the 17th century? Anybody? <laughs> Any of y'all? Okay. That's how you catch the vampires. They they sometimes like, yeah, I was. They're like, oh, darn it. These are right in the heart. All right. So here's over many, many more cycles. And you see that the maximum are getting smaller now, right? And, and even this last one is even smaller. So, you know, back in 1960, before I was born, <laughs> we had a big maximum. And then, you know, you see that's like a, a, a bigger cycle on top of that cycle. So here it is. Yes, right. Here's our photosphere. Uh, so here's a question for you. You look at the sun. Suppose there are no sunspots. And suppose some, sometimes there are a lot of sunspots. In which configuration is the sun the brightest? When it's covered with black, dark spots or when it's not? Gotcha. <laughs> it's actually brighter when it has sunspots. And the reason why, reason why is these bright regions you see around the sunspots, plage regions, they make up for, and plage is the French word for beach out here, they add uh, more brightness than the sunspots take away. Now, if we look at the surface of the sun in detail, this is from the Swedish vacuum telescope, you see the 3D structure of these convective cells. When I say the surface of the sun is boiling, that's what you're seeing here. So the dark regions, the bright regions are where the material comes up, and the dark regions is where it descends again, right? So it's like coming up and descending, coming up and descending. And as it does so, where you see these really bright spots is where there are magnetic fields anchored into the sun's surface. And it's the interaction between those magnetic fields and the plasma at the sun's surface that heats those, that plasma. Here, if we go and take a, a zoom in to that region, Wulum. And you can see the dynamics of the granulation, right? You can see how it's moving around. Here's some sunspots right here. Um, and if we zoom in closer on the sunspot, you'll see that it has, oh, here again, on this side, we have what is known as a magnetogram. The white and black areas are regions of strong magnetic fields. One represents magnetic fields anchored going into the sun. The other is magnetic fields anchored coming out of the sun, like the north and south poles of a magnet. And you see that the sunspot activity is correlated with the uh, existence of the strong magnetic field, all right? And here you can see the detailed structure of the sunspot. So you have the umbra in the center, the penumbra, and then you have the granulation pattern around it. And by the way, that's really big. That's like bigger than the earth. Ooh, it moves. Did you think Galileo when I said that? <laughs> Nerd joke. <laughs> All right. Here's a sunspot racing by, just in case. But you see that they break up, they coalesce, they converge, they diverge, they break up. And so some sunspots last for several solar rotations. It takes a month for the sun to make one rotation. Um, and then some of them, you know, pass on the other side of the sun and they're gone. It's over. Kaput. And so what makes a sunspot is, is regions where there are incredibly strong magnetic fields. And so what that does is it disrupts that flow, that boiling flow of material rising and falling. These sunspots, the plasma is, um, is ionized. What does that mean? The atoms that we're made up of are electrically neutral. 
right? So if you have an atomic nucleus with protons and have a positive charge, electrons wrap themselves around it, and now it's like the charge ain't there, right? So if you would imagine, what would the universe be like without any electrons? Every proton in the universe would try to get as far away from each other as they could, right? But because we have electrons, wrap, electron wraps around the proton, it's like, ah, no charge. Um, but when you take matter that is charged and you put it in the presence of a magnetic field, it is forced to orbit that magnetic field. The magnetic field can change the trajectory, does change the trajectory of particles. And so what matters is the ratio between the particle pressure, our normal gas pressure, compared to the pressure of the magnetic field. And the pressure of the magnetic field goes with the square of the strength of the magnetic field. So in a region of really strong magnetic field, it can really inhibit the flow of plasmas. So when you see a dark sunspot, one thing to note is that it's really not dark. When you look at a total solar eclipse halfway covering the sun, you see that sunspots are still bright. They're just not as bright as the stuff around them, right? So, you know, they look dark in contrast. So again, all of this material, all of this dynamics at the surface of the sun. So when I say we think of the sun in, 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 two, in two ways, right? It's two parts. There is the core, there's the envelope. The other thing is the surface, right? Because the surface is the part that interacts with us, right? That's where the sun reaches out and touches us. You can truly say that we are embedded in the sun's extended outer atmosphere. So if you look at the sun's magnetic fields over the course of its 11 year cycle, you'll see that it goes from times where you have very few mixed magnetic fields near the equator, and then you get a lot of mixed magnetic fields, right? And so you go with a lot of magnetic fields, and very little, then a lot. So what's happening here? Well, the sun, just like the earth, is like a bar magnet. It'll have at one time, uh, you know, positive at the north and negative at the south, but the sun is made of plasma. So those plasmas start to flow and those magnetic fields start to mix. And when they're the most mixed up is when we get the most activity. And it has some strange things, behaviors that we don't quite yet understand. For example, if you look at the northern hemisphere of the sun and compare it to the southern hemisphere, you'll see that in one hemisphere, one magnetic polarity leaves, the sun rotates that way, so here, white is leading black. And in the opposite hemisphere, you have the opposite, right? Black is leading white. And we don't know why that is, but it's one of those weird things. And so here again is the sun near solar minimum, very few sunspots. And here the sun is near solar maximum. And what we call the surface of the sun, by the way, the name of that is the photosphere. Today, the sun is around 15 million degrees in its core. And it's around 5,800 at its surface. But the surface is not a surface. It is 100 times less dense than the air you're breathing right now, right? What makes it the surface is that for layers beneath this, when light is emitted, it is reabsorbed by the matter of the sun. But when you get to this layer, when that light is emitted, it leaves the sun and comes out to space. So the act of seeing means light from that location reached my eye, right? And, you know, it can trick us because we're used to light traveling in a straight line. So when we have things like, you know, uh, gravitational lensing, like if the light, like my man is right here, right? What's your name, ma'am? Okay. Miss Linda's right here. What's his name, sir? Joseph. Joseph's right there. I thought you were Larry. But anyway, like if, we're, if I'm perfectly alive, I can't see Joseph behind Linda. But, you know, she was very massive. His, her gravity would bend the light around her. And I see two images on either side of her. And because I'm used to light traveling in straight lines, I think he, there's two Josephs back there. You would love that movie. <laughs> you ever see that movie where the dude clones himself? <laughs> you saw that movie. All right. So the biggest changes in the sun's activity with the solar cycle occur in the hottest parts of the sun's atmosphere. Even though the surface of the sun is only 5,800 degrees, it indefinitely maintains a hot atmosphere in the billions of degrees. So these are images from a Japanese satellite called Yoko. Um, and these active regions, as they're called, right here is solar minimum, and here is solar maximum. Um, these are like 5 million degrees Kelvin. So think about it like this. Suppose this table 
was 5,800 degrees. But if I put my hand here, it was 5 million degrees. That's the opposite of what we expect, right? That's called the coronal heating problem. And, you know, we still haven't put it all together yet. Now, the way that we see the solar activity is by viewing the sun in different wavelengths of light. And this is actually what my PhD work was on last century. Um, but here we're going from cooler temperatures to hotter temperatures. And we're able to do this because of the fact that if you have an atom, like, say, iron, Iron has 26 protons in its nucleus. So when it's cool here on Earth, say, for example, that iron is always surrounded by, that iron nucleus, 26 electrons. But when you put it somewhere hot, those atoms and things are moving around so fast that collisions will give electrons on the iron so much energy that they can leave the atom. So if you look here, oh, dang it, it doesn't have it. Let me see if this one has it. Okay, so if you look, here's what happened. I'm going to do it like, I'm going to draw. Say, for example, this is temperature, and this is the population of some species. So let's say I call iron with all of its electrons iron one. All right, as I raise the temperature, nothing happens, nothing happens, and then suddenly I start losing my population of iron one. If I have iron with one electron missing, I call it iron two. So iron two will start to exist because I knocked one electron off of that. And then it'll stop existing once you get sufficiently hot because now I've knocked off another electron, right? And so each ion only exists in a narrow range of temperatures. So I can say by taking a photograph in iron nine, for example, I am imaging the sun at 800,000 degrees. So here is an image in helium uh, 10830 that shows the chromosphere at 8,000 degrees. Here we are, we're going up to 10,000 degrees. Oh, now I'll say it, this is from my PhD. This is a photograph of me in the 1990s, 1994. We were flying our rocket. Anybody here watch Ancient Aliens? Do not self-identify. Don't do it. <laughs> you don't know my man Richard Hoover there. He's a he's a he's from he's from Alabama. Um, so we pioneered this technology that takes old images. So we fly 16 to 22 telescopes at a time. Every hole you see here goes to a different solar telescope. And here's what our data looked like, right? When we first did. It. So this is the chromosphere, here was the corona. And the reason why we flew so many telescopes is you see this coronal loop here. You see how it has a cro constant cross-section? All our colleagues said, we know that magnetic fields diverge with height. Something must be wrong with your optics. So we're like, we'll show you. <laughs> we'll fly eight telescopes with the same wavelength. And now this is the standard that we get. So you, you can't see these, but again, this is multi-thermal imaging of the sun's atmosphere by imaging in a particular emission line. What is this? All right, something that didn't play. Lower transition region. And here you can see the different type of phenomena that we're able to observe at each uh, temperature. So here we're gonna see an eruption of a filament, right? So this is, you know, the action of magnetic fields giving energy <coughs> to the plasma. Now understand this. On Earth, I weigh just under 200 pounds. On the sun, I weigh three tons, right? Surface gravity on the sun is 30 times stronger than surface gravity on Earth. But yet, this material gets enough energy to get shot up off the surface of the sun. Process that for a minute, <laughs> right? The, the magnitude of what's necessary to do that. So we look into the corona, we suddenly see that the, the atmosphere is dominated by these loop structures. And what you would notice is that if you look at the feet of these loops, they are connecting areas that are black and white, right? Areas of opposite polarity. So in, in reality, there are magnetic fields everywhere, but where the magnetic fields are doing the special thing that cause them to heat the plasma is where they glow, glow. And here again is a nice eruptive event. So there are two types of explosions that occur on the surface of the sun, major explosions. One we call a flare, 
The other we call a coronal mass ejection. So what you just witnessed is a flare. The difference between a flare and a coronal mass ejection is whether or not it's an explosion of light only. And what that means is that there is a much stronger magnetic field above the magnetic field that you see that holds this confined near the surface. But if the explosion is much greater than the strength of the overlying magnetic field can hold, then the entire thing just bursts out and just get a huge explosion of matter from the surface of the sun. So here's a corona at 1.5 million degrees. And again, you know, same kind of structure, right? It's very active. There's all kinds of stuff going on on all kinds of scales. Two point five million. So, what creates these magnetic fields? So, this is the old model of the creation of the solar magnetic field. So, if you look at times of solar minimum, it's like a nice bar magnet. But the thing about the sun, because it's not a solid surface, it experiences what we call differential rotation. Different latitudes rotate at different rates. So the equator rotates the fastest. And because this material is a plasma and these are magnetic fields, they're tied one to another, all right? So the plasma pressure is greatest beneath the surface. So the plasma moves the magnetic field and ties them up and twists them up until there's a lot of tension in them. And the magnetic fields become buoyant and they rise to the surface and then they erupt. And when they erupt, they have all this tension in them. Like if you took a rubber band and you know, twisted it over and over and over. And sometimes they look at the, a nearby magnetic field and say, yo, if I break up with that one and connect with you, I get rid of some of this energy. And that's what it does, right? It, it reconnects and gets rid of that energy. Another way that the magnetic field um, energizes the plasma is that waves can exist on these magnetic fields. It can be what are called transverse waves or you know, like that. Right, or it can be a uh, torsional wave that are like that, right? But it goes up up the surface. Um, and all three of those processes contribute to heating the sun's uh, atmosphere. So here again is a negative image of coronal plasma loops, and what's happening here is it's like a bar magnet. But of course, these two can like exchange, right? This south can connect to that north, that south can connect to that north, and that might be a lower energy state. And if it can find those lower energy states, it does. And that's what drives all that activity. But <clears throat> remember, hey, man, when I speak, you're supposed to have my beverage right here. Uh, a Stella and a nice German Stein. Sorry, I drank that for you. you, you I knew you, you killed it, yeah. Only one place. I, I spoke at the American Museum of Natural History. They gave me a beer. <laughs> we got to step on right game here. But basically, all these particles are streaming out from the sun, as well as electric and magnetic fields. And they are streaming towards Earth. And lucky for us, we have our own strong magnetic field. And I think it's underappreciated how lucky we are here on Earth. Because the universe doesn't like light. The universe is kind of anti-light. So in order to survive as light, you need to hide in little nooks and crannies in the universe that protects you from those particles, right? So what do we have? We have the sun's big giant magnetic field. Then we have the Earth's big magnetic field. Then we have the Earth's tiny little atmosphere. And most life is gonna be found under the oceans and under the ground. So most life on Earth has four radiation shields protecting it. But guess what? The sun's just calming down. The Earth looks like it might be flipping. So we might be tripping. We not, we, thank you. Look, I expect everybody to laugh at my humor. If you don't, I'm robbing everybody before you leave. All right. Uh, but understand how big of a coincidence this is, right? So we have Venus and Mars right next door to Earth. Mars is half the size of Earth. Half the size means that it's much less than half the mass. Because the more mass you get, the more tightly packed down you are, right? You don't double the size when you double the mass. You're, you know, you're less than double the size when you double the mass because it's more packed, right? But Mars is so small that it's completely solidified all the way through, whereas the Earth still has a molten iron core to have current to create our strong magnetic field. The other thing about Earth 
Venus is the same size as the Earth. So it could have a liquid metal core, but the Earth spins fast. One rotation of 24 hours. I think one rotation on Venus is like, what, 170 days or something like that? Is that it? Yeah, thank you, sir. So, listen, you can know. And I certainly don't. I'm kind of, that's my swag, my scientific wow. Yes. So, um, you know, we are so lucky because we have all the protection from the radiation, but we still have a transparent atmosphere, right? If you look at atmospheres, how, look at all the bodies in our solar system and the 5,000 exoplanets that we discovered, how many of them we characterize their atmospheres? Atmospheres come in two types in general. Super thick, Venus, Titan, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, or completely absent. Mercury, the moon, Ganymede, Europa, Callisto, right? So in most places, where are you going to find fluids? Like, you know, fluids are necessary for life. We have surface liquids in our ocean. Titan has surface liquids in, in lakes and, and, and rivers and such. But most of the liquids are under miles of atmosphere, like on Titan, miles of ice, like Europa or Enceladus, or miles of rock, like Ganymede or Pluto. I don't know what Pluto is. But it has a subsurface ocean, apparently. But, you know, you don't have access to space to, to know that there's a universe out there. But the other thing is, you don't have access to light, right? All light on Earth today, excuse me, all life on Earth today requires light for photosynthesis and oxygen for respiration. But when life got started on Earth, light and oxygen were corrosive to it. Right, so life had to get started in the absence of light and oxygen. But once it did, how long did it take it to take advantage of that light energy? Two billion years. Then it took another two billion years to figure out oxygen respiration in order to have enough energy in the chemical reaction to create multicellular life like our cells. Right, so it's a huge coincidence that you know the combination of our strong magnetic field. Um, with our super thin atmosphere that we're able to be here. I see myself like frozen on the screen. That's pretty uh, creepy. <laughs> Which one is the real me? Is this the real me or is that the real me? I didn't, you have to ask Mr. Musk about that, I think. Elon? Elon, yeah. He's, oh. man, he always messes stuff up. But you see how, how, how ultra slim our atmosphere is? And that's why, you know, all this talk about, uh, you know, global climate change, let me give you a little bit of perspective on that, right? We've had three climate emergencies. Acid rain, old and old, old air, global climate change. If you look at the history of, of life on Earth, life has done all kinds of things with our atmosphere, right? There was a great oxidation event when um, cyanobacteria first started uh, producing oxygen. It resulted in the planet freezing over all the way to the equator for 100 million years. So, what we normally do is say, let's go about our business. Oops, let's do something about what we just messed up, right? Instead, we should recognize that our atmosphere is so thin, we can basically engineer it, right? We can make it what we want it to be. And so that's what we need. We need a worldwide treaty. So that's why I'm asking for your vote for Tyrant Emperor of Earth. I'm running. It's me or that uh, emperor from Star Wars. You choose. You want that with the, the light? That dude's evil, man. I'm not as evil. All right. I like Star Wars. You like the Mandalorian? You. <laughs> so here's our atmosphere, our, our magnetic field. Our magnetic field interacts with the uh, sun's magnetic field and creates what we call solar storms. So basically, the magnetic field of the sun can cause Earth's magnetic field to reconnect. And that reconnection of the magnetic field, changing magnetic fields, create electric fields. And electric fields drive currents. So you know that your toothbrush, you sit it on the thing, or your phone, you sit it on the thing. That's what they're doing. They're using the charging, changing magnetic field to create electric fields that charge your battery, right? So the same thing happens around Earth. There are already particles trapped in our magnetic field. So when the sun's interaction with our magnetic field causes our magnetic field to reconnect, that accelerates those particles 
and they come down those field lines and they hit the poles, creating the aurora. And the big misunderstanding is that there is, uh, you know, it's the particles from the sun that are impacting our atmosphere, but really it's particles that are already trapped in our magnetic field. Oh yeah, so this is about the uh, Maunder minimum. So again, here's another like, yeah, yeah, you're getting tired of seeing those, aren't you? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So let's look at some big explosions. So here are coronal mass ejections uh, from the Soho spacecraft. So the sun is under this occulting disk, right, which is bigger than the sun. When you see one come directly at us, that's when you get all those like particles, right? It goes out everywhere around the sun. Boom, right? All those cosmic rays hit the camera. Um, but what's going on here is this is a rod that holds the occulting disk. This material is a billion times less bright than the sun's surface. So the sun is a circle in here, right? But the key is, think how big these explosions are compared to the size of the sun. They're bigger than the sun itself. Here's another one, right? And so the circle in the center is the sun's diameter. And you see that coronal mass ejection. Like, how do you make an explosion bigger than yourself? It's kind of like when I flex my bicep. It becomes like, woo! It's like bigger than me. That's why I don't do it. So here's another of uh, some nice coronal mass ejections. I'm going to show you guys something really cool in a second here. When the Soho <laughs> spacecraft was put up, Oh, yeah, that's a big one coming at us. Is this my sun grazer? Yeah, you see that comet down here at the bottom right? So there are these comets that were discovered when the Soho spacecraft went up called sun grazer comets. And they come in and they hit the sun. And sometimes when they do, they trigger coronal mass ejections themselves, like this one. Here it comes. Here it comes. Oh, no, it's going to collide with the sun. Booyah! Yeah. It definitely did. Because you can imagine what's going to happen to a big ball of ice when it hits the sun. That sucker's going to evaporate. So here is Comet Anki, and here comes the coronal mass ejection. It's going to interact with it, and it rips the tail off. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah. So don't just be walking around in outer space willy nilly. You know, if it's not the Borg or the Klingons, it's the sun ripping your tail off. Uh, yeah, so we're in there. And so if you look at all these atmospheric processes, ITM stands for ionosphere, thermosphere, mesosphere, these different areas of our atmosphere. So if you look at Mars' atmosphere, Mars has almost no atmosphere. We say it has an atmosphere, but it's almost no atmosphere. It's such a not atmosphere that radiation from the sun penetrates six feet into the ground at Mars. And Mars is thought to have lost its atmosphere due to solar erosion from the solar wind. Why hasn't the Earth? Well, the answer may surprise you. It has. We have been boiling our atmosphere off. The difference, though, is that we have plate tectonics. And so we're in a steady state where we gain atmosphere geologically as we lose atmosphere, right? And so the ionosphere is like a reservoir of the uh, lost atmosphere into the region around our planet, right? Uh, held there by our magnetic field. And so we have these um, two satellites out there now called Icon and Gold, which are measuring and characterizing those processes. But you see that all of these terrestrial atmospheric processes are actually driven by the sun, not your car. Um, and so you see that, you know, when you look at, where the heck, come on, movie. Where, yeah. So as the sun rotates, it has these magnetic fields, and as it rotates, the magnetic fields form the spiral. It has some sort of name. And so some of the particles follow the magnetic field line to the planets, and others just go out straight, right? So, yeah. And so here's our fleet of sun-observing satellites. So we have some that are in low Earth orbit. We have some that, or that, some that orbit at the gravitational minimum point between the sun and the Earth. We have others that are, you know, farther out there, uh, ice and wind. 
but we have a whole fleet of observatories that are watching the sun every day and trying to figure out what the heck is it going to do next so that we can predict when, for example, if we have assets in space, and we do, when to put them in a safe mode. If we have astronauts, humans in space, when to go into your titanium bunker, <laughs> you know, and, uh, but you want to see it coming. Uh, you want to see you you want to see it coming rather than wait for it to happen and then react. It's sort of like you guys ever hear that story about the deadliest radioactive object on Earth? This core they made uh, in the World War II days of plutonium core. Yeah, yeah the guy who like so basically had this process for you know removing it and opening it. It's in this like case, and this guy was not following the process. He left that thing open for like just a little like split second killed everybody in the room. Not instantly, but, you know, sl slowly and long and slow. Um, I don't know how we got on that, but <laughs> here is the sun's magnetic field. So the project that I'm a part of right now is a satellite called IMAP, the Interstellar Mapping and Acceleration Probe. And the purpose of IMAP is to map out the heliosphere and the heliopause and the heliosheet. So just like particles are trapped in the Earth's magnetic field, particles are trapped in the sun's magnetic field. So when solar wind particles go out there, a particle that's trapped in the solar magnetic field, if it's trapped in the field, that means that it has an electric charge. So you can neutralize that charge. A solar wind particle would go out there, boom, give it an electron. Now it's no longer charged. It's free from the magnetic field. And so it's stream in every direction. And so we're able to measure these so-called energetic neutral atoms. Yes, sir. Will what explode? The tectonic plate? They don't explode. They they have little bitty tiny explosions. They got they get dragged under and melt and create volcanoes. I love volcanoes. I don't know about you. But anyway, the, the, the previous mission, you know the way this works, right? So you have an idea, you put up a cheap spacecraft, and then you show that, oh, yeah, it really works, and you put up the expensive one, right? So the cheap spacecraft is called IBEX, and IMAP is the more expensive one. But IBEX shows that this bow shock that we expected to happen, right, as this is not there. We don't have a bow shock. We're not moving fast enough. So we have a bow wave, you know, like a boat's moving through the ocean. We thought we'd be more like a supersonic airplane moving through the sky with a, with a shock, but instead we just got a wave. All right. I don't know what this slide is for, but I think that's the end. Yes, it is. All right, questions? Well, first, let's thank God. <laughs> By the way, question is the word we use in Mississippi to mean question. So, any questions? Yes, ma'am. No, it ain't. Yep. Yeah, or faster. But you'd vaporize. This is it's hypothetical. That's right. Yeah. Another. Um, it's interesting that you made out of those particles that the like. Well, it's the same hydrogen that we have here on Earth. Right? It's the same stuff. And you know, the thing is, is that you know, you can't tell one proton from another. You can't tell one electron from another. And what that tells us is that the proton and the electron are not an actual thing. It's like a C note. Right in music. If I play a trumpet, C, and you play a C, they both sound like, oh, it's the same note, it's a C, they're all identical. Well, they're not real. C doesn't exist. What exists is vibrations in air, right? And the same way with these particles. These particles are just excitation in fields, right? So it's, it, it, you know, so there's the electron field that permeates all the universe. So it's not even that the particles are what's made up of everything. We're an illusion, we're just made up of fields. Yes, sir. When it's in the check? <laughs> oh, think about it. All right. So how do they 
I know there's a him, him, and Joe, there's a yeah. number of commentators that right. have uh, some yeah. of this stuff. But, so how do they catch up with you to do that? Obviously, you all are at the same room. Right. Yeah, it's funny because it, uh, it's a lot of luck and timing, okay. right? So I had two luck events. So the first lucky event was this woman named Stacy Matthews was hired to find talent for Discovery. And she reached out to me and a bunch of other physicists. We were like, hey, they call you, they call you, yeah, right? And none of us got the role for which she was trying to find somebody for. But then she calls me later and she goes, hey, Hakeem, didn't you go to this particular school for grad school? And I was like, yeah, I did. She's like, I remember you. I was an undergraduate while you were a graduate student. And I remember you used to help a lot of people. So I'm going to find a way to help you. And she got me on the science advisor. They were forming a new science advisor panel. So she got me on the science advisor panel. So that's how I got to know the the the, the network um, host. I mean, the network executive, right? So I was an advisor to them for like four years. And then what happens is I do, I meet this woman at Discovery who trains their talent. And I was living in Florida at the time. And she lived, I was living in Melbourne, Florida, near Nassau, you know, Coco, right? And she lives in Orlando. She's like, oh, Hakeem, I'll give you a freebie. I'll just tell you how to, you know, because I was so broke, I couldn't pay her. And she was like, all right, here's what's happening. I am uh, helping the people in Orlando to organize their TEDx. So I'm going to get you to be a speaker there, and that should help you out. So when they did that, they wrote the description. So if you look at the Big Bang, how we know on YouTube, that's my that's the TED Talk. With the description there, they described me as a science communicator. This was 2009, a different time, right? Today, everybody's a science communicator, right? <laughs> but back then, you know, there was like three, <laughs> right? And so I get a call from um, this producer in London, and he's like, uh, yeah, we're making this new show, Outrageous Act of Science. We'd like for you to be in it, right? And so I asked him, like, how did you find me? He goes, oh, simple. I just went to YouTube, typed in science communicator, you're the only person who popped up. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, that'll never work again. <laughs> right? Everybody, as soon as they step foot into college, I'm sorry, I'm a communicator. Uh, Come to my YouTube channel. Here's my TikTok, right? Yeah. 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 So it's completely lost. Yeah. Yeah, right? Oh, thank you. And so I, I always tell a producer, I was like, you know, the other part of the club is when I moved to California, people started complimenting me on my voice, right? And so, you know, it was a weird thing, because like, you know, in Mississippi, I was neither strong nor had a deep voice. I go to California, suddenly I'm strong, big, and got a deep voice. I, I didn't change. It's all relative, right? So my girlfriend at the time gives me this newspaper clipping, and it says, oh, do, you, do people compliment you on your voice? Come take class at the voice acting. And I did. And I didn't, never thought that I'd be doing voice acting or any acting at all. I was doing it for fun. But it turned out to be the training that I needed for doing this stuff, knowing how to deliver and this yeah. sort of thing. So I tell the producers, oh, yeah, I'm so lucky. They're like, nah, man, a lot of people get the opportunity. You took advantage of it, right? And and what it was was I got trained. That was the thing. Yeah. And the, and the training is, the, the simple training for acting is really simple. Be yourself. Don't act. That's it. If you if you throw a microphone, if I can throw a microphone or a camera in your face, you're exactly as you are now. You're a great actor. <laughs> but it's really hard to do, right? Like, you guys remember that commercial, Got Milk? Oh. So I was voice acting, and the guy who did Got Milk, his name was Diddy Delt. He was also a voice actor in the Bay Area. And so you show up to these voice acting auditions, you got to sign in. You sign in, you see Diddy Delt's already signed in. <laughs> you know, like, ah. But imagine, you walk in, and they give you a microphone, and it's two words, Got Milk. <laughs> How are you landing that job? You know, so they told in, in training they told you a trick. What was you know give them three reads, you know, and tell them what the emotion is. Take one, dry, got milk. Take two, cool, got milk. Take three, dirty. <laughs> Perfect, right? So I go to my first big audition. It was with MTV, which is who I did the most work for, and. uh they literally said, they gave me a pack of papers and said, Hakeem, take the first five lines and give us five different reads on each one. 25 voices. In my head, I didn't say this to them. I was like, oh, you want an actor. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought I had um, But they hired me, so I did a lot of work for them. You want to hear some of it? 
No, here. Let's see here. But we do have a telescope tour. Uh, Nobody care about your telescope. Uh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. A little, a little old school voice acting. Yeah. Chocolates are bad for you. Flowers die. So this year, email the eternal Valentine that neither time nor teeth can destroy. VH1s, download your love Valentine's. Yeah. Just click on the link in your music player. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> nice. Yeah, all right, all right. <laughs> all right. Get trained. That's the answer. Get trained. Get trained in physics. Get trained in mathematics. Learn the code. And if anybody wants my cash app, Huh? You love school? Oh, uh, uh, ooh. Oh. Hopefully that continues. That is a good thing to love. Most people are afraid of math. Yeah. All right, folks. Oh, uh, so we have Miss here, here, Jonathan. I was around. Oh, yeah, there. Uh, they will be taking you over in uh, shifts over yeah. to the uh, thirty-two inch telescope on Research Hall, where we will give you a. Yeah, uh, we got, we got a large group and um, on a very big telescope, so we'll try to fix them every while. It's a big telescope. Last time we had a group this size, it got a little bit chaotic. Oh. We'll do our best to fix it. Not a big dome. So I hear you all the time, meaning he yeah. to he yeah. that TV, <laughs> and I go, come on, that is, and come down, and I'll sit for a while. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I appreciate it. Are you there? I sure am. Is everything going all right over there? Ian. All right. Can you hear me? You Ian? Take, I sure can, Rob. Okay, can you I probably me? can't hear you. Uh, uh -oh. I need to make you a co-host, don't I? I'm going to assume yes, because... Can you, can you hear me now yet, Rob? I can't hear you. So um, I'm going to make you a co-host. We, we can hear you, Ian. Uh, you should be able to... The speaker is able to share your screen now, Ian. Okay, let's share the VNC right here and log in to the desktop. All right, can everybody see the desktop of the observatory for all our fine folks at home? Can I get a thumbs up in the chat? I should probably open the chat. There we go. All right. Well, my name is Ian. No, Elm. I couldn't hear I'm any of a you folks, but I fourth think Ian's year got it, undergraduate. So enjoy. Uh, this will be my second year, not only working as a tour guide of the observatory, but also as uh, part of Dr. Peter Plopchan's wow. Exoplanet Research Group, uh, where we use this telescope on George Mason to find planets outside of our own. Yeah, you're about to get drunk. But anyway. <laughs> so first, so I'll get into the security there. cameras here. Sometimes it takes a minute. Does anybody have any questions to start out with? Check the chat. Uh, can you hear now? Can you hear me now, Natasha? All righty. Uh, it appears the Skyx is still not loading. Regardless, uh, the first thing we use to control the telescope itself is the dome panel. Uh, obviously, the telescope is inside of a dome, which would be apparent if this would load. Let's let this run in the background in that case. Maybe it just needs a good old turn off and on again. Do it the hard way. I apologize for the difficulty. We just recently upgraded to Windows 11. And some programs have been a bit rough around the edges in the transition. But for here, we open, close, and home and sync the dome. Ian, can you hear me? I sure can, Peter. Yeah, so you have to close that program, the X out of that. I see. And then right click rather than left click on the night owl and run as and a, run as administrator. Yeah, try that. Thank you for the update. 
again, a lot of these programs we've been using since 2011, and they don't seem to like the new and improved windows. Uh, it doesn't look like it started. Try again. Oh, here it is. I sure accept. Here we go. And now there I am. Hello. So right now uh, I'm in the control room of the observatory on Research Hall. Right over here is the dome itself that we open and close. Right now it's open so we can look at the stars as well as the door being open and the lights being on. Down here is the main motor of the telescope. We have its own motor because it tends to break a lot and we like making sure things work around here. And over here, of course, is our main telescope, the 32 inch Ritchie Cretion Cassegrain Reflector. Big words, a lot of words, but all you need to know is it is a reflector telescope. It has mirrors that reflect. Uh, there are three of them, the largest, the 32 inch mirror is at the, the rearmost end here, and it is shaped like a bowl with a hole that reflects light in and back up to the secondary mirror up top, which is bubble shaped and can be moved up and down to focus the telescope to the third mirror, which is at the bottom here, right in front of our eyepiece, as well as our camera, which is that big square device in front of that flat device you can see on the end here. But in order to actually move the telescope, we need to use this program called the SkyX, a planetarium in a box that shows us what is up tonight, uh, both below and above the horizon, as well as the 3D prime meridian here at red. The orange line uh, represents the danger zone about 10 to 15 degrees up, below which uh, things just get too distorted uh, because if you know how a sunset works, uh, light, from the sun is incoming and is being distorted by nitrogen and oxygen and all the other fun gases that make the air, turning everything red as well as wiggly, which although it makes a very pretty view for the sun, it is not so pretty when you're trying to get research done and thus all of your measurements are thrown off. So we try to keep our hard observations to the top of the sky where there is less air in the way, such as around and we'll start with uh, Beetlejuice of Orion, not from the movie. So now I've clicked Beetlejuice. I can also search Beetle. It would help if I knew how to spell Beetlejuice. Click and find and hit slow. Confirm I would like to look at Beetlejuice. And now it will move. We check back in on the camera. And both the dome and the telescope are moving. You can even see some trees in the background there. Let's wait for the dome to stop moving. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Feel free to stop me at any time. I, I know I can get a bit long winded, but now that we have a clear view of the sky, let's drag this over so it's actually visible on this monitor. This is Maxim DL Pro, which we use to take pictures with our CCD camera, charge couple device. Uh, let's pick the red filter. So as, it, as the cameras on your phone have a bunch of little pixels that take in light and put out electricity, so does this one, but for us, since we're looking at things hundreds, sometimes millions or even billions of light years away, our pixels have to be much more sensitive and much less picky as to what light comes in so that uh, they'll take every color of light versus the specialized red, green, and blue pixels a modern phone camera has. So in order to tell what the color of an object is, both either to make pretty colored image by putting together a red, green or blue picture, or by just telling what the temperature of an object is by taking a blue image and a green image and then subtracting the brightness, uh, we need to employ the use of our filter wheel, which is in front of the camera right here, that wide part. And the big part is the camera itself. The filter wheel itself 
has several outputs at the moment. Uh, where did you go? There did you go? Ranging from infrared hydrogen alpha, the primary emission line of hydrogen, to the familiar rainbow colors, uh, ultraviolet and clear, which lets everything through. For Betelgeuse, a red supergiant, and also because there's light pollution in Northern Virginia, I'm going to go. I'm going to go ahead and try a tenth of a second exposure with the red filter and hope that it doesn't make another image like this. Because, oh, let's check the, move the information over here, check the counts. Even then, it's still at the maximum. Just like with an old fashioned camera, the longer you hold open the shutter, the you more light will. H alpha. Oh, you want H alpha for Beetlejuice? Or is this Beetlejuice? Yeah. Yeah, you can That's do. That's true. It's very red. Do you want to try slewing to uh, Venus after this? Yes. Okay, good. Go ahead. Let's try Beetlejuice in the H alpha. As a red supergiant, it is near the end of its life. And thanks to a lot of funny math, when stars get old, they tend to get redder. And Beetlejuice, be whoa, that was too far. Beetlejuice being on death's door, probably might have exploded by now, is in fact very, very red. But what is not red is the planet Venus. The red planet is Mars. And I don't want to do that. I want to return that to normal and slew. Here we have Nasir with her tour guide group. I would like to use the sky X to slew to the planet Venus in the sky. Hello, Nasir. How are you doing? I have a tour over the internet. Goodbye, Nasir. Bye. Slew to the planet Venus for now. Go ahead and preemptively. Well, if it's a planet, I feel like I should be using the ultraviolet filter uh, since it is, in fact, the second brightest object in the night sky. I might want to cut this in half here. And now that it has stopped moving and I'm confirming on the cameras. Oh, there's. Now it's not, now the dome has stopped moving. That's, that's not Maxim. This is Maxim. And now I can take a picture of Venus. It does appear a bit blobby, but that is because I can stretch it all the way out. Yes, Venus just like the moon has phases. So right now we are seeing the born, the waxing gibbous phase of Venus. Uh, unlike with the moon, it's pretty rare to see, or rarer to see a full Venus as that would mean that Venus is in between, or no, the sun, is in between us and Venus, which normally blocks Venus. So in a few months, uh, we might not be able to see this lovely planet. Lovely to look at from a very safe distance, like our observatory on Earth. Not so lovely uh, to take a field trip or vacation to. As very famously known, Venus's incredibly thick carbon dioxide atmosphere uh, makes the surface of the planet roughly 900 degrees Fahrenheit hot enough to melt lead as well as you and Soviet space probes. Did Dr. O talk about Venus in the talk at all? I overheard a bit of it and I heard he was talking about how Mars froze. I assume he went into Venus as well after that. Uh, but regardless, we can also check out Mars as that's up tonight. Boop. Spin it around. One of the greatest mysteries. Ooh. 
through to check the planetary camera. Let's see if that'll work. Yeah, I was just wondering if he did. The focus would be different, so maybe not doing it live. Doing it live is probably not a good idea. But, All right, uh, let's stick with the camera from ours then. Yeah. Uh, I can talk about it later. Let's go with UV and, well, it's definitely smaller than Venus, so let's try 0 0.1. Are they taking flash photography inside the dome? Is that Mars? Did I catch them the same time they were taking the picture? Try adjusting the stretch. That's Mars. Yeah. As Dr. O mentioned, Mars is uh, about the tenth, a tenth of the mass of the Earth. And thus, thanks to math and how rocks work, about the third of the size of Earth. And since, unlike the moon or Jupiter, Saturn does not have any big moons, it does have two captured asteroids, but they are much too small in size for us to see with our telescope, considering Mars is about 10 pixels across here. So it appears Mars is also in a little bit of a give us phase, but Unfortunately, thanks to math and angular resolution, the red planet of science fiction fame is ter not terribly much more than a little red blob. The same can be said for the ice giants, uh, Uranus and Neptune, which I don't think they're up this time of year, which although, especially in the eyepiece, hello, Jonathan, they are very blue and definitely not a star. That's about all you can tell them from them. So. In order to see a really good object, we're going to need, I see, we're going to need to look at something far, far bigger than a planet. For example, an entire galaxy, if it's up tonight. Yes, it is. Oh, yes. Here we go. Does anybody in the chat know what this M might stand for on M52? Well, Mars is also very far away. Milky Way, good guess, Natasha. Messier, thank you, Gene. Give a little round of applause. Uh, most of the Messier, some of the Messier objects are in our Milky Way galaxy, but the Messier catalog discovered and cataloged by Charles Messier in the late 1700s, uh, mostly consisted of other galaxies outside of our own Milky Way, such as this one right here, M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, which is right next to M52, as we will hopefully see in the image. Uh, we have some lovely guests with us in the control room. Say hello to the internet. Hello, internet. <laughs> what is the optical design of the telescope? Asks Parker. The optical design should be a uh, Ritchie Crucian cast grain reflector. Uh, that might be something for the people here to write down on their handy dandy pieces of paper with uh, R I T C H E Y uh, C R I E. C H E N C A S S E G R I A N. Probably went too fast for the lovely people in real life. What is the aperture and field of view of the CCD? The aperture of the telescope should be the width of the largest mirror, 32 inches across in diameter, uh, 16 inches in radius. And the field of view of the CCD is about 26 arc minutes, uh, slightly smaller than the full moon, which is almost full tonight. And we can look at it later. Uh, usually, I try to focus on the moon since it's close, and we can make out a good hunk of detail. Helps for focusing. That's not you. That's this one. Oop. Please come up. Thank you. 
So now that we are looking at something much further away than a planet, let's bump up that exposure time to 30 and see what happens. Boop. It, now that we are holding the camera open for 30 seconds, it will expose for a lot longer as well as the 14 second readout of the signal traveling from the telescope to the computer and appearing on my screen here. Do you have any other additional requirements for your sheets, oh, lovely yeah, real life people? Signature. Oh, you, need, you want an autograph? Yeah. Well, the object uh, in this, whoa, the object in this image should be the Whirlpool Galaxy. If I can adjust the brightness. So the, the proper, name, proper name is Whirlpool Galaxy. Is M52 the Whirlpool Galaxy? Should be. It looks like yeah, you're too close to the moon probably tonight. How far away are you from the moon? Uh, Whirlpool Galaxy. Oh, that's not terrible then. And you're in an R filter? Oh, is that where the Whirlpool Galaxy is? Oops, these. That was a random globular cluster. Sometimes this happens. Richie Christian Cassegrain, yes, sir. The object is a spiral galaxy, the Whirlpool. Yes, the Whirlpool Galaxy is, as the name implies, a spiral galaxy. Uh, should be about 60,000. No, that's within the mount. What is it? 60 million light years away? M51. Thank you, Gene. It's M51. It appears I made a typo earlier. Yes. Uh, I can pull it up once I am ready. If you were to look it up online. Uh, this, it is about a third of that. It is 23 million light years away. I was thinking of the diameter which of the galaxy, which is 60,000 light years across. So it's a bit smaller than the Milky Way. Uh, and it's about 160, time, 160 billion times the weight, the mass of the sun. As we watch the telescope, Scope slowly spin around thanks to me not typing two instead of one. As you can see, scattered around most of the Messier catalog objects are spread pretty far apart, including the famous Great Nebula of Orion, here listed in yellow as one of our most popular targets, as well as M33, the Andromeda Galaxy, which is just like the full moon too big to see through our CCD with its 26 square minute, 26 arc minute field of view. Uh, most of the time when I've tried to take pictures of Andromeda, I just get the core of the galaxy, which although interesting by itself for science does not make for a pretty picture as just a big egg yolk looking thing. But this is Firefox. This is not what I want to click on. This is what I want to click on. And 30 seconds from now, we should get a nice, lovely spiral galaxy, the Whirlpool Galaxy. Yes, but a bit dimmer because we have uh, light pollution, thanks to, every, yeah. Well, not, not thanks to the galaxy itself. It's entirely Earth-based effects. Uh, the optical design of the telescope, Natasha, should be the uh, Richie Cretion Cassegrain Reflector. Let's, you know what, I should probably type it in the chat. That'll Cretion Cassegrain Reflector. What? What is that? That is not a galaxy. And it's saturated. 30 seconds shouldn't saturate over there, should it? That, that's some serious light pollution from someone light, light in the dome. Uh, 
and the flat lamp can't be on because this is a tour. Let's can try 20 go, seconds and see if somebody 20, takes another picture. Probably too many lights in the dome. Can you take a look in the camera? Uh, can you, let's try and ping uh, and see on Discord. Is she in there? Are you in the dome, Nasir? Tell them to get their... Rob, can you tell people in the dome to get their lights off? I can't see the Whirlpool Galaxy. This is this is atrocious. It's, what do you mean? That's not what it looks like? It's supposed to be a galaxy. Look at that. Look at that again. That's not even... It doesn't look like one. Go ahead and adjust the stretch a little bit, but yeah, you got just a lot of light. What filter... I see. Do you want me to switch over to the eyepiece? And which target? <laughs> Orion Nebula and the eyepiece. This is uh, the purse. Yes, that is very important. Let's adjust the focus. And then go ahead and show them the uh, older views when it, no one's in the dome. <laughs> sure thing. Where is the focus? It is over here on the other monitor. And I would explain it. Go back to the handy dandy board, 4061. Also, Peter, uh, this this is the this is the number for the CCD. That's not the right one. This is the right one. And let's go ahead and slew to Orion. Oop. Any other? Nothing else in the chat. Slowly spins around once more. Did you need the gist of anything else? Good, uh, sir. It's time. Yeah, I've been staring at like the telescope now. I think. One more time to write autographs on my knee. Yes. So just just to. They also have a Zoom version, but I'm not sure how we're, I'm supposed to autograph that. Just to recap, it's 32 inches in diameter for the aperture, 26 arc minutes for the uh, field of view, and it's the Ritchie Fishing reflector. Yes. Who do you have for your lab section? We don't have labs. We don't have. Oh, just which, class. which class is this? Uh, one of three. One of three. J Jason Lee. Jason. Lee. I see. I'm I'm trying to get used to who gives what worksheets to all the different. And the object we viewed was the M51 Whirlpool Galaxy, which is a spiral, correct? Yes. And this is a very, as well as the very bad, Venus, but yeah. Very bad drawing for it looks like. You know what? It's better than what I could do. Okay. That's Thank why I'm so a scientist much. and not an artist. Okay. So should, yes, should be on the Orion Nebula. Let's go tell Rob that. And let's see if the focuser is correct. It is still moving. Yes, that is correct, good sir. Does anybody else have any other additional uh, requests for information? Let's ping Rob. Supposed to draw the image. Well, you are in luck because we should, uh, assuming it survived the jump. Yes. Don't leave just yet. Here, here's what M51 is supposed to be, uh, assuming people weren't taking flash pictures in the dome. It is a nice spiral galaxy, vaguely similar to the Milky Way galaxy, albeit less of a barred spiral. There's a bug on the other monitor. Uh, less of a barred spiral. It's more of a spirally spiral, type A spiral versus type B spiral, barred spiral. So the center is round instead of a bar. Two major arms pretty tightly wound, so that would be spiral A, A, and then we have a smaller companion galaxy that I thought was M52, but evidently that is not the case. It is slowly being drawn into the galaxy as gas and dust is being siphoned off into the bigger spirals. Most of these galaxies are uh, cannibals, including the Milky Way, which is also in the process of eating the 
large and small Magellan Magellanic clouds, which unfortunately are only visible from the Southern hemisphere. Uh, I believe we should get some of those in the stock photos folder for future reference. Which observatory in this telescope? Which observatory is this telescope at? Asked Joseph. It should be the George Mason University Observatory at Research Hall. Uh, we don't have very many other observatories in Northern Virginia due to being one of the most densely populated regions in the contiguous 48 United States. However, if you join the Friends of the Observatory Club uh, next semester, because we already did this semester and it went rather well, uh, we take a field trip to the Green Bank National Radio Observatory in Green Bank, West Virginia, right over the state line in Pocahontas County, which is far, far larger than our, what is that? Just under three foot telescope. Their telescope is literally larger than the Statue of Liberty and the single largest steerable object in the world. Uh, they collect radio data from distant stars and galaxies that make this look like it's right in front of us by comparison. Uh, everything is very clean and pretty and cool out there, aside from the fact that there are no cell phones or any other technology, because they can mess up the signal of the colossal radio telescope, but you don't need it for the couple of days we'll be going on the trip. Very fun, and I would recommend. Another object request? Uh, can I get your signature real quick? Yes, you another person needs, yeah, uh, need another person needs to sign autograph on a laptop. Now I have finger. three laptops. Look at this. Three computers on me. See if I can sign with a touchpad. It appears I deactivated the marker. I apologize for the delay for the lovely internet people, but it is very difficult trying to write with the touchpad. There we go. That's close enough. All right, thank you. There you are. Good, sir. I'm just famous tonight. Up. Thank you. Is that Corsair keyboard? I don't know. Rob handled all the purchases. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's my turn. I wonder if this guy's going to ask for his pencil back. Here you are. And yours. Pointing it out. And that picture that you showed us was that for uh, the longest Yes, this is, or er, I closed it. This is the Whirlpool Galaxy that I have open. Yeah. Uh, I can also show off a couple others if we have time before the people inside the dome come inside the control room. Gotcha. Okay, I took pictures of that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Much for coming by. Hello there. Um, Do you need my signature as well? Um, so I have a question. So the small refractor of the what did you see through that? Uh, I think we mostly used the small refractor for close by objects. I okay. think it's on the it's either on the full moon or on Venus tonight. So Hello, Rob. See her tells me that she's going to stay in the dome. So you are controller. Okay, I am controller. Did did it focus? Oh yeah, you moved the focus. They might be in my I pocket. Know. I haven't but looked at the telescope yet. I'm assuming this year was left well when you go pop my head in. Let's try this it's one last ugly. autograph. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Any other requests? Uh, Peter, should I keep the virtual tour going? No, you're good. All righty. Thank you all for stopping by. Uh, please be sure to check us out again in a couple weeks for the next talk of Evening Under the Stars. Uh, if you are a student here at Mason, please consider giving Photo, Friends uh, of the Observatory. And here's Mr. Photo with me in the room. Would you like to talk more about what you do? Sure. If you guys have any interest at all in astronomy, even if you're not an astronomy major, Photo is a really good uh, club to join. It represents the uh, Friends of the Astronomy Club. We do a lot of uh, events kind of like this where we just have like a public tour. Jonathan, the sir needs you to swap out. Um, sure. Okay. Means... I guess I guess we and can't learn about Photo. You want to look at the focus? Yeah, Let's... she says it needs to be more in focus. Uh, focus. Uh, go help her with that. I Use the focus right there while I not only talk about the physics club, but then 
uh, wrap up and close the meeting. So as well as the Friends of the Observatory, you can also join the Physics and Astronomy Society, the unofficial sister club of Friends of the Observatory. Uh, this coming week, I will be hosting a meeting uh, centered around Easter and a fun kinematics activity that I'm sure everyone will enjoy. Uh, we have a few other more events planned uh, for the month of April to wind down and prepare for finals. Uh, which if you check us out on Instagram, uh, Discord, and uh, uh, Photo as well has Instagram and Discord, as well as a Twitter, I believe. Uh, there, there should all be Photo GMU in various configurations, and ours is SPS GMU. Uh, definitely be sure to give both these clubs out a both of these clubs a try, and we look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you for coming again. Take care. Boop. Oh, that's not how you stop the meeting. How do you stop the meeting? <laughs>